Okay, let's get right on into the lesson. When we talk about fasting, it's interesting that uh, with the modern translations, some of the scriptures that have been removed give us a little insight into the power of fasting. A lot of times I hear people say they're going to fast from watching television or fast from doing a particular activity. Fasting always pertains to food and drink. When you abstain from doing activities, you are consecrating yourself, and that's different. You're setting yourself apart to be used by the Most High. You're setting yourself apart to be used for holy services, but that is consecrating. To say that I'm going to go a month without watching TV, I'm consecrating myself. I'm making myself holy unto the Lord. To say that I'm going to um, afflict myself by walking to work every day instead of driving or riding a bicycle, that's a consecration. That's a vow I'm making for a particular pur purpose to be holy unto the Lord. Fasting is always and only when you refrain from food or drink for a given amount of time. And the definition says fasting is to abstain from food, to eat sparingly, or abstain from some foods. Okay, this is coming from Webster. We see where it says that to eat sparingly or to abstain from certain foods or drinks. We see that in Daniel, this, when he went into his 21 days of prayer and fasting, he denied himself pleasant breads and wines, but he did continue to eat during that time. He just eliminated those things that were pleasing to him. And then on other occasions we, in the scripture, we see where people eliminated all food and all drink. We see that Christ fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without any food or drink. We see that Elijah was given something to eat and drink, and then that, uh, that substance alone fortified him for 40 days and 40 nights where he didn't know he had nothing else to eat during that time period. We know that Moses, when he went up on the mountain, he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. But that was all the abstinence of food and drink. Put this up here again. Consecration fasting is the abstinence from food and or drink for a determined period of time. Consecration is to abstain from pleasures and to set yourself apart wholly unto the most high. Both are required and both are to be are, are worthy of the believers to um, participate in. When we fast, we are tearing down strongholds. We are making petitions known to the Most High on our behalf or on the behalf of others. We are gaining power and we are subduing the enemy and the powers that be that are evil in this world. Okay, we know that it is a powerful thing because if we look at Matthew 17 and verse 21, the disciples were asking Christ why they could not cast demons out. And they were frustrated because they were basically made to look like fools. And Christ told them, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. If we look at Mark 9 and 29, 
same scenario. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. Now, the challenge that I set before you is to pull up those two scriptures in any other translation. And you will see where the numbering skips right over that verse number and continues on. Well, if a believer has faith, that's great. But Christ gave us a key when he says the power comes when you add fasting to your prayers. So then it's kind of curious to me that the modern translations would eliminate that verse altogether. Very curious. Even people who practice occultism, witchcraft and whatever other occultic practices there are, there may be, they tend to fast more than Christians fast because Christians tend to be lazy. And when I say Christians, I'm talking about believers of the word, believers of the Bible. I'm not, I'm not speaking of a denomination. So a lot of people who are believers don't put a lot of focus on the importance of fasting. But we see that even people in the occult do. Let's look at Daniel. Chapter six. Verse 17. I mean, chapter six, verses 17 through 18. This is King Darius, who was the king of Persia. And we know that he relied heavily on occultic practices because he called in magicians, he called in sorcerers, he called in astrologers and everything when he was trying to find out uh, things that were a mystery to him. But when he put out an edict, when he was conned into putting out an edict that said that everyone had to pray to him and anyone found praying to any other gods would be killed, he had an affinity for Daniel because Daniel had shared some things with him. And lo and behold, the edict that he put his signature on backfired because Daniel was a devout follower and worshiper of the Most High. And it was found that he was continuing to pray towards Jerusalem to his God three times a day. And so King Darius' hands was tied and he had to put Daniel in the lion's den. And verse 17 of chapter six says, a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him and his sleep fled from him. So even King Darius knew the power of fasting. And after that, we all know how the story ended. He went to check on Daniel and Daniel was alive and well. Okay, now when we fast, it's important to understand that fasting is not a magic act. It's not like rubbing a lamp and nodding our head and saying, okay, this thing is definitely going to happen. That's not what fasting is. Um, and there's certain times when fasting may not yield what we are wanting or fasting for because the most high knows all things, the beginning for our ways are not like his ways. And also, there are some things that we might do that ties the hand of the Most High. 
For instance, we know from scripture that no acts of blasphemy goes without judgment. So if you have committed blasphemy or caused others to blaspheme God because of something that you have done, and blasphemy is to give Satan and his world, his kingdom, credit for something the most higher the Holy Spirit has done. If you have done those things, then fasting <clears throat> is not going to yield for you what you were wanting it to yield for you. We have an example of this. If we look at 2 Samuel, If we look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 through 14, and then just for the sake of summarizing verse 16 and verse 19, we'll see something about, uh, this is about David. Well, we know David had slept with someone else's wife and then put out an order for her husband to be killed when he found out that she was pregnant. Bathsheba. And so here in verse 13, it says, and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because this deed, however, because by this deed, thou has given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. David therefore besought God for the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servant, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So, Fasting is not a guarantee that your prayers are going to be answered, especially if you are not in the right position spiritually, or especially if you have blasphemed in some kind of way and the Most High is holding you in judgment for that. Does that mean to just give up on the idea of fasting altogether? Definitely not. We have been called to fast from the beginning. Uh, there's one of the pseudographia testaments that I read. I think it was either Peter or Thomas that has a scripture that says from the beginning we were commanded to fast. It is interesting to me that a lot of these books that we have been told to shun, in fact, hold principles that shed light on how our faith walk is actually supposed to be carried out. Now, sometimes we use fasting when we are repenting, when we are turning away, changing our thoughts about how we have been behaving, living, and we want to do things the way the Most High wants us, requires of us. So if we have sinned, if we have rebelled, if we have given ourselves over to idols or other gods and we come to the realization that we have done those things and we are repentant, we can call, we could go into fasting. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3 through 6. He spake unto the house of Israel, saying, if ye, if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange God and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Okay. Don't just say I'm going to serve the most high and still do things that the other nations that do not know the most high are doing. The customs of the other nations do not mix with the commands of the Most High. Verse four, 
Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel and Mitzvah. And their request was heard, if you read further. Another reason that we might fast is if we find ourselves in a situation that we need deliverance and intervention. If we find ourselves up against uh, a spiritual warfare and the enemy is coming at us from all sides and we need the most high to give us his divine help because our weapons of warfare are not carnal. As believers, we don't fight like the world fight. The world might pick up actual weapons, okay? And at another point, I'll at another lesson, I'll discuss because some people misuse a scripture in the New Testament where Christ tells them to sell what they have and pick up a sword. And they negate to read the rest of that, the following verse that says, so that prophecy can be fulfilled. And the prophecy pertaining to that was that Christ and his followers would be considered criminals. He was not telling them to actually pick up a sword and use it. Why, we, why do we know that? Because the scripture doesn't contradict itself and we are told our weapons are not carnal. So our weapons are spiritual. So when we facing strong ramparts from the enemy, then we go to the most high in prayer because he is our battle ax. He is our strong tower. He is our big horns, our shield and our buckler. And what we cannot do of our own might, most definitely he can do. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And if you have time in your leisure, I would encourage you to read that whole chapter. It's very uh, edifying. But let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and I have summarized it. So we're gonna look at verses one, three, 12, 13, and 22. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. That's a great memory verse right there. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon, are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord, sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. The Lord came to their defense in a big way. This brings, I wanna bring out another point about fasting here. Sometimes uh, we think fasting is an individual thing, but we see time and time again in scripture that there were corporate fasts, meaning there were fast calls for the whole nation or for multiple people at one time. 
So yes, fasting can be an individual thing. And we are told that when it's an individual thing, we're not supposed to go and talk about it with other people. We're not supposed to boast and brag about it with other people. It's a private thing unto the Lord. But there are times because we know where two or three are gathered, the most high is in the midst. And so there are times when we can combine our power against the forces of evil and call thousands to our help. We can call the most high to our help. When I say thousands, I'm talking about his ministers of war, that his angels that he will send to fight on our behalf. So it is always a good thing to have others join you for different causes because another reason is because our faith is never the same from day to day. And so when you, your chances of that power being intensified and harnessed is greater when you have multiple people joining you in a fast because someone surely is going to be on a high note at some point. Everybody shouldn't be weak at the same time. Okay. So we see here that when they all came together, their prayers were answered in a big way against what seemed impossible. Let's look at Jonah. Okay, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh and warn them of the coming destruction. Now, my understanding, I could be wrong, is that Nineveh was not an Israelite nation, but there were Israelites held captive in Nineveh. And so uh, Jonah had a problem with saving those people. He, he was like, why am I going to save them? You know, they are just evil at heart and they don't deserve to be saved. And so we know about how he rebelled. And as a result, uh, the Most High had him swallowed by a big fish and he was in the belly of that big fish for three days. Then he came to his senses, and now here we are at, to see what was the result when he finally became obedient. Others turned to the Most High. Jonah 3, verses 4 through 10. And Jonah began to enter into a city, into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Now, even people who were not of the nation had been in a custom of fasting. They knew what to do. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented means he changed his mind of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. It's interesting because a lot of people credit Paul with preaching to Gentiles and, and converting Gentiles, but a lot, uh, everyone forgets that Jonah had on two occasions pretty much did the same. When he was on the ship and the ship was being tossed to and fro, the people on the ship who served other gods said, "What well, they 
they cast lots, they did all kinds of things and they were trying to figure out what was what was causing this. And Jonah said, my God is doing it. Throw me overboard. And when they threw him overboard and the sea immediately calmed down, they all paid homage to the most high and made vows to the most high. So we see that Jonah had a hand in people who served other gods turning to God. We see here that the, the king of Nineveh served other gods and was evil along with his citizens that were evil as well because most people followed the direction of their leaders. And as a result of Jonah's obedience, they gave their lives to the most high as well, okay? Sometimes uh, I want no. I want to pull up another witness here of the Most High answering us when we are contrite. Okay, so we saw there that the people of Nineveh, Nineveh were contrite, and the Most High listened to them. Now I want us to look at 1 Kings 21. Okay, I have to see where I am. Yes, 1 Kings, here we go. Chapter 21, verses 23 through 29. Here we have Ahab. Ahab is often described as a spineless man. He gave his wife total control of him. Whatever she said went, and on many occasions, she made him look weak. <clears throat> as a result of her evilness, the Most High was bringing judgment upon her and Ahab and anyone associated with them. But let's see what happens. Verse 23, and of Jezebel also spoke, spake the Lord saying, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did, but there was none like unto Ahab. What do they mean by this? Hold on and see which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. He did so much wickedness, it says there was none like him. And why did he do this wickedness? Whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. She put the thoughts and the suggestions in his mind and he executed them. Verse 26, and he did very abominably in, the, in following idols, according to all, all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishvite saying, seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring evil upon his house. Why? Because all that evil was blasphemy against the most high. It was given power to the enemy, okay? Now, sometimes we can pray to the most high when we are in need. Well, that tends to be most of the, the most freak, frequent way that we pray to the most high. Ezra, Chapter eight, verses 21 through 23. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God. Fasting always involves some kind of affliction to seek him a right way for us. 
and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. He was ashamed to take on the wep the carnal weapons by asking the king's help. Because we had spoken to the king and said, the hand of our God is upon all of them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all of them that forsake him. Okay, so one, I'm not going to rely on the weapons, the carnal weapons of warfare. And two, now I have to save faith because I put this big message out here that our God will deliver us. So I surely can't go back on that and now ask for help. So in verse 23, so we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So he helped us when we went to him for help. Okay, and then one other way that I'd like to highlight, and there are others, but I'm just gonna highlight this other way that we can uh, employ the act of fasting, and that is by praying for other people. Psalms 35 and 10, David says, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for, for him? Yea, the poor and the needy from him that's, that spoileth him. Okay, those who are poor and needy and those who are in positions of power take advantage of them and make their lives miserable. Verse 37, I mean, thir verse 11, chapter 35, False witnesses did rise up and they laid to my charge things that I knew not, okay? They accused me of things that I did not even do. And they were my brothers. Verse 12, they rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. I was only good to my brethren yet they still bear false witness against me. They still rose up against me. They still rewarded my goodness with evil. But look at verse 35, 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into my own bosom. Meaning, when he said my prayer returned into my own bosom, meaning I prayed for them as though I was praying for myself, for my own needs. I put aside what they had done and I prayed for them. So we see that fast, when we see others in need, we can pray and fast for them as well. Okay, now, that we understand that much about fasting, let me say one thing that the average believer does not know, and that's largely in part to being told not to read extra books. Now, the book of Judith is an apocrypha book, and it was removed after 1811, 1611, whichever year the King James was first published. It was either 1611 or 1811. I can't quite remember. But after that fact, Judith, along with about nine, eight or nine other books, were taken out of the canon. If you look back, you'll see those books in there in the original King James Version. Also, it's interesting that those books still remain in the, any Catholic Bible that you might read. Now, the Catholic Bibles are not written in King James Version, but they all contain the Apocrypha still. Those books that were removed are still in their canonized Bible. So if we look at Judith, this is what I'm getting to right here. Judith chapter eight, verse six. And she fasted all the days of her widowhood, save the eaves of the Sabbaths and the Sabbaths 
and the eaves of the new moons and the new moons and the feasts and solemn days of the house of Israel. Okay, notice those are the days that she did not fast because we have people that do week long fasts, month fasts, and they are fasting even on the Sabbath. We are not supposed to fast on the Sabbath except for one high holy day, which is the day of atonement where we are called to treat it like a Sabbath. Okay, let's look, if we look in Jubilees, chapter 50, where we're given in some, in, uh, all of, uh, most of chapter 50 deals with the Sabbath. And then when we get to the end, it kind of sums up some of what was said before. Let's take a look at what it says about the Sabbath here. Ch Jubilees chapter 50, verses 12 through 13. And every man who does any work thereon or goes on a journey or tills his farm, whether in his house or any other place, this is journeying or whatever, whether uh, in his house or any other place, and whoever lights a fire or rides on any beast or travels by ship on the sea or whoever strikes or kills anything or slaughters a beast or a bird or whoever catches an animal or a bird or fish or whoever fasts or makes war on the Sabbath. The man who does any of these things on the Sabbath shall die, so that the children of Israel shall observe the Sabbaths according to the commandments regarding the Sabbaths of the land, as it is written in the tablets, which he gave to into my hands. This is Moses writing uh, the book of the times or Jubilees. Uh, that which he gave into my hands that I should write out for thee the laws of the seasons and the seasons according to the divisions of their days. Now, it's interesting that it tells us right there that even those who fast on the Sabbath will, be, will surely die and be cut off from the nation. It is interesting whenever the post-Constantine Christian establishment tells you not to look at something or remove something from your viewing, most likely it's a salvational point. It is something that is, usually something is held within those texts that will keep you from the lake of fire. So we have people not knowing about the rules of the Sabbath in its entirety, thinking they are doing righteous acts when in fact they are bringing damnation and judgment upon themselves. And people continue to be rebellious or to uh, operate in sin or transgressions because judgment is not swift because I'm still living and I'm 95 years old. I've done this all my life. The scripture says I'm gonna die, but I'm doing it and I'm still alive. Well, there is a judgment. And the final judgment is the death of your soul. So you will surely die. Just because judgment is not swift doesn't mean that it has not been delayed, okay? And sometimes judgment is delayed to give you a chance to repent and change from your ways. Or sometimes judgment is delayed to, so that you could continue to meet the full measure of your transgressions, the full measure of your sins. We know that uh, when we fast on our own throughout the year, we afflict ourselves by not eating and drinking. But there are some things that people do when they fast that does not lend itself to fasting. It, it weakens the fast and it takes away some of that power. What is the perfect fast? 
the perfect fast is that we afflict ourselves and that we separate ourselves from the world. Um, a lot of people feel that fast, this is recapping, a lot of people feel that fasting is just not eating and drinking for the whole day, but then they spend no energy focusing on scripture, focusing on the most high or listening to praise and worship. They are still engaged with social media. They're still watching TV, going to the movies. They're still going shopping. They're still hanging out with worldly friends. They're still going to uh, get together with get togethers that non-believers are having. They are still listening to secular, non-religious music. Um, I don't know, did I say, they're still, sometimes they're even still engaging in unwholesome conversation, gossiping, calling people on the phone. When you fast, you should be separating yourself as much as possible from the world making yourself holy unto the Lord. That is what the fasting and praying comes in. That's what gives you power. You cannot mix the two kingdoms together and expect to have, be, have rule over one, okay? You can't have bitter and sweet water. You cannot be hot and cold. You can't be, I mean, you can't be lukewarm. You have to, be solidly in one place. Otherwise, your fasting is for naught. Now, prior to this, have you fasted and been negligent in those areas or guilty of doing those things and you feel as though your fast was answered? Well, there's a strong possibility that it was because the Most High meets us where we are and where our understanding is. Also, we know that he has mercy on whom he has mercy on and compassion on whom he has compassion on. At the end of the day, he knows our heart. But when we know better, we do better. So what does Isaiah say is, well, what does the Most High say through Isaiah is the perfect fast? Okay, I'm going to read it from the Good News Translation. The Lord says, shout as loud as you can and tell Israel about their sins. They worship me every day, claiming they are eager to know my ways and obey my laws. That's what they say out of their mouth. They say they want me to give them just laws and that they take pleasure in worshiping me. Okay. The people ask, why should we fast if the Lord never notices? Okay, apparently they're in the habit of fasting and not seeing the results or the fruits of their fasting. Why? Because they are fasting amiss, because their hearts are not where it should be, because they have distractions going on at the same time. So verse three again, the people ask, why should we fast if the Lord never notices? Why should we go without food if he pays no attention? Okay, so now we're questioning God. The Lord says to them, the truth is that at the same time you fast, you pursue your own interests. Okay, you entertain yourself. As a matter of fact, in the King James Version, it uses the word entertain. You pursue your own interests while you say you're fasting. And on top of that, you oppress your workers, not just workers, but you oppress people, period. Your fasting makes you violent and you quarrel and fight. Why do you become violent and irritable and quarrel and fight when you're fasting? Probably because you have not consecrated yourself and you have two systems at war going on the system, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God, because we know the Holy Spirit makes us peaceable. So when we find ourselves irritable, we probably haven't consecrated ourselves while we are fasting. Do you think this kind of fasting will make me listen to your prayers? Says the Most High. Okay, let's go on to the second part.
When you fast, you make yourself suffer and you bow your heads low like a blade of grass and spread out sackcloth and ashes to lie on. Is that what you call fasting? Because you deny yourself and you make yourself look poor, your lips are chapped. <laughs> You know, your face is all ashy. You're going around telling everybody, Woo, I can't wait for this fast to be over. I got one more hour left to fast and I can't wait to throw down. I already know what I'm going to eat. You afflict yourself, but you are bragging that you afflict yourself. You, you're bragging about how long you've done it and all of these things. Is that what you call fasting? Do you think I will be pleased with that? Verse six, the kind of, of fasting I want is this. And now we are entering what is called the perfect fast. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Okay, if, some, if, you, have, if you have an ought against someone, stop holding whatever you're holding against them, let it go. Forgive them, let it go. Um, are you judging people unrighteously? Let it go. Stop being critical of others. Let it go. If you're calling yourself fasting. Fasting is all about forgiveness. You can't be forgiven if you don't forgive. And ironically, that verse was taken out of a script out of two scriptures <laughs> that if you forgive, if you don't forgive, the most high won't forgive you. Two scriptures removed that as well. Two, that, was, that verse was removed from other translations. Okay, I think I said it right that time. Okay, what else is required of a perfect fast? Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless or the poor. Okay, we have gotten to this thing where we say, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I don't know those people. He deserved to be in that lowly state or they're just trying to scam us and they're not, they're probably not really homeless or whatever. When you are doing a fast, you are encouraged to look for people who are hungry and feed them. You are encouraged to give someone homeless a place to stay. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear. And this is a big one here that follows. Do not refuse to help your own relatives. Okay, don't get so caught up with helping others that you have relatives in need. And because you know their circumstances, you judge them and refuse to give them assistance. Whether you, because... The same circumstances you judge your relatives about, those strangers you're helping are in those positions that they're in for a reason as well. Their family knows why they're in that position. And that's probably why their worldly family is not helping them. But you are. Well, help your relatives as well. Do not refuse to help your relatives. Okay, and let's go on and, and uh, come to the end of that passage. Then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun and your wounds will be quickly healed, okay? If you are sick and you are fasting to get well, well, science ironically has told us that when we fast, the body heals itself. Rogue cells, rogue cancer cells, uh, Free radicals, all of those cells die when you fast. You starve it out of them. If you have a spiritual stronghold, you can overcome those strongholds, those spirits that are oppressing you. You can overcome them by starving them out by fasting. If you have a spirit of lust, then you can fast and consecrate yourself and that spirit will leave. If you have a lying spirit, if you have a judgmental or critical spirit, if you have a spirit of self-righteousness, we know spirits that are oppressing us. We're, not, we're, we're aware of when we're operating in unrighteous, ungodly ways. If you have a spirit of fault finding, fast and starve those spirits out. Find scriptures and 
by all means, cast down those thoughts and imaginations. Okay? Um, it says you will be quickly healed if you are fasting right. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. But remember now, what were the Israelites saying at the beginning? Why should we fast when he doesn't hear us? He doesn't answer us. We're just, we're just starving ourselves for nothing. Why were they not being answered? Because they were not fasting according to how the Most High wants them to fast. What alms were they giving? How were they helping others? How were they uh, afflicting themselves? Were they still operating in the world while they called themselves fasting and then wondering why they were still sick? Why their prayers were not being answered? Okay, verse 10. Well, verse nine, when you pray, I will answer you. When you call to me, I will respond. If you put an end to oppression, to every gesture of contempt, to every evil word, let me pause there and pull up what is contempt? Contempt. Contempt is the act of despising, the state of mind of one who despises or has disdain for something or someone, the lack of respect or reverence for something, the state of being despised, if you always have contempt for your fellow brothers and your fellow sisters, then the most you are hindering your fast, the, the results of your fasting. Every gesture of contempt. So shut down those thoughts. To every evil word, if you give food to the, okay, he's saying, if you put an end to every evil word, these are things we need to get rid of every evil word that you say. If you give food to the hungry and satisfy, satisfy those who are in need, then the darkness around you will turn to the brightness of noon. And I will always guide you and satisfy you with good things. I will keep you strong and well. People who fast a lot very seldom succumb to illnesses. Okay, you will be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring of water that never goes dry. Your people will rebuild what has long been in ruins, building again on the old foundations. You will be known as the people who rebuilt the wall, who restored the ruined houses. Okay, if believers can get back to the point of fasting and having fat. Uh, power, if we, they can, if we can get back to the point of not speaking evil, not having contempt, contempt towards one another and doing all those things that we, that we just read, then we will lead our people back into right standing with the most high because people tend to follow those things that are good. They want to emulate those things that are prosperous. And by fasting correctly, we become, in the eyes of those looking, a prosperous person, a prosperous people. And people want to do whatever it is that you're doing that will get you that way, that will get them that way. Okay? So, um, in soap science, falsely so called, as the scripture says, it tells people that if they fast, their body will heal, the cells will regenerate faster, dead cells will, will die off. And even things like arthritis is allevi alleviated through fasting. Why? Because you're not consuming those things that cause inflammation of your joints. You're not consuming those things that are free radical, okay? So even if you are doing a worldly fast by just eliminating foods for given periods of time, we see that there's a big trend for intermittent fasting. I know for a fact that when you fast, you don't succumb to illnesses very seldom. Uh, our family, as an example, 
multiple times during the month as a family unit, we call for a fast. One of us will say what it is that we are corporately fasting for at that time. And we all spend a day or two in fasting. There have been times when I have fasted, done a dry fast for three days, no food, no water. Now I've got to admit, during that time, I was, well, I should have saved this for, um, I should have saved this for the open discussion, but because we're practically at the open discussion. But since it's on my mind, I'll go on and share it now. Yes, at the end of a three day dry fast, I was seeing stars. <laughs> Every time I got up, you know, I saw stars and uh, any sudden movements. But I can say that things that I was seeking clarity for came to me through dreams and visions, vivid dreams, um, almost like in technicolor. There was a time when I was doing a lot of fasting when even my aunt, and my husband, I would share my dreams with them. And both of them, independent of each other, said, you sure are having a lot of dreams lately, <laughs> you know? And, I, and, and that, that's why. I have listened to people who call themselves prophets or prophetesses. And it seems like every day they're saying what the Lord is showing them. And at one point, I questioned someone that I was watching. And I thought, are they really hearing stuff every single day then later on they brought out that they don't watch they never watch television they, they they talked about their lifestyle and it came to me when i went three years without turning my television on at all and eliminated foods and started following the dietary laws of, that the Most High gave us and fasted on a consistent basis, I was hearing from the Most High on a regular basis. When, you, when we make ourselves available, he makes himself available. And the thing is, the more you drift away from him and the more you become lax in er different areas, you can't just pick right back up where you left off. He makes you work your way back to that spot before he moves you further. And so you're constantly starting over. So when you hear people that say, oh, nobody hears from God like that, they don't believe it probably because that power is lacking in their life because they have put themselves in a position of being powerless through their lifestyle and what they allow, what they share from the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. Okay, now we have, uh, I wanna bring out three scriptures that speak to what we read in Isaiah. In Galatians 6, verses 6 and verse 10, it says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, especially unto them who are our brothers, especially unto them who are our relatives especially unto fellow believers. Let us do good to, unto all men. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse 11 says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God, okay? When you bless others, they in turn see the God in you. I can't count how many times that I have gone, and I'm not saying this to be self-righteous, I'm saying this to hopefully edify someone and spur someone into doing the same. I cannot count how many times I have taken things to homeless people and they thanked God for that act because they know people who do not have an understanding of the most high most likely are not going to reach out to them when they are in their darkest moments or at their lowest place. So our acts let people see God. We become a living testament to his goodness. Matthew 23 and 12 says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves 
will be exalted. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions or anything about what we have discussed today? Um, well, most importantly, uh, the previous scriptures that we were looking at um, referring to our fasting perfectly. I forgot to write down the book. I don't remember it. <laughs> oh, it's I got Isaiah. The, I got the verses. Okay. Isaiah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we move on, let me give you a couple of questions that you might consider when you're fasting. Uh, you might ask yourself, why am I fasting? Are you fasting for more power? more power from the Holy Spirit? Are you fasting uh, for a breakthrough from a stronghold or from spirits that are oppressing you? Are you fasting for revelation and clarity, uh, for health concerns? Are you fasting on behalf of others? And even are you fasting to gain control of your weight? Because that's spiritual as well. So ask yourself, why am I fasting? And then determine the guidelines of the fast that you're going to employ. Now, I'm not talking about day of atonement because we're told how to do it then, but I'm talking about fasting outside of that. Are you abstaining from all food and liquid? Or are you only eliminating certain foods and liquids? Maybe you have an affinity to drink carbonated uh, sodas, and you're going to cut that out. Will you be fasting all day? Are you breaking your fast into intervals? For example, are you going to fast from 11 to 8 p.m. and then uh, maybe fast from 11 at night till 11 the next day and allow yourself a time in between there to nourish yourself? Are you fasting for one day or multiple days? How long are you gonna be fasting? How many days are you committing yourself to prayer and fasting? Um, you know, it is, fasting won't kill you. We see where by faith, we have witnesses in scripture that fasted 40 days. It's not gonna kill you. Fasting three days without food and water is not going to kill you. I love watching Naked and Afraid, Alone, and all those survival shows. And it's interesting that some of those people go weeks without eating anything, and they survive. So when it's put out there that you have to eat three times a day and this and that, or you won't be nourished or whatever, all of that go, is contrary to what scripture tells us. Okay, let me put up discussion questions and we'll have a quick little discussion perhaps. Um, before we go into the first one, let's look at the second one. Ways to give alms. What are some ways that we can give alms or bless people or... Uh, Give. Uh, giving alms is just giving, chari making charitable, doing charitable acts. Some ways that we can give alms might be buying gift cards to randomly give out. We might give alms by uh, doing housekeeping for someone. Maybe there's an elderly person who can't get along that well and you go to their house and offer to clean their home. You might give alms, of course, they're the basic ways of giving food, giving clothes. Make sure when you're giving clothes that you're not giving clothes that you no longer wear because they are in disrepair. If you would not like to wear it, if someone gave it to you, then don't give it to someone else. And another thing is presentation when we're talking about giving clothes. Do you want to receive trash, even if it's out of a form of generosity? When you give clothes to someone, make sure that it's clean, presentable, so that they don't feel ashamed taking on that, that clothes. I was saying when we give clothes, make sure that it's clean and presentable, something that you would not mind receiving. You 
Just because the person is homeless doesn't mean they want to receive shoes that are run over and beat down. It's just one step away from what they're currently wearing. And, you know, nobody wants to receive something that looks like it's been scrubbed on the concrete or has stains in it. Sure, they might wear it out of need, but that's not going to lift their countenance and bring joy to their spirit. Make it a point to focus on the presentation of what you were giving. Uh, the question was, what are some ways we can give alms? Do you have any suggestions? Girl, first of all, as soon as you said that, you froze again. just like you're freezing right now, <laughs> bad reception. So I'll go on and continue with some examples. Uh, you may get a hotel gift card and give it to a homeless person. If there's a hotel not too far from where they are, let them have one night or several nights in a hotel where they could shower, you know, and enjoy the free breakfast that's available at the hotel. Many, many ways of giving alms. You can give alms through your time and service, monetarily, okay? So those are just some things to think about that's outside of the box. Okay, it looks like Rakita's having some technical difficulties. So I'm gonna go on and um, what was the other? The other discussion question was, is fasting a struggle for you? If fasting is a struggle for you, that's probably because the enemy in the spirit realm knows the power that it affords you. So the enemy is always going to try to distract you or beguile you. We have to make sure that we push past that and continue to fast. Ask the Most High to let His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, give us a grace for the fast, and uh, so that we can be successful. And always keep in mind, you can go to a store and pay it forward. You can go to a store, have a predetermined amount of money, and say, okay. Uh, the person that the Most High directs me to, I'm going to pay their groceries or I'm going to pay some of their groceries or whatever item that they have at the counter. Uh, even extending it out to little kids. If you see a family that's struggling in the store, uh, buy something for the little child, buy a bicycle or even just give them some candy because maybe they're struggling and they don't get treats very often. If you see them, praise them for their behavior or whatnot, give them something in that way. Uh, many ways, I have on many occasions, you know, that trend came out probably a decade ago about paying it forward, where when I go to a drive through which I don't really anymore, but when you go to a drive through and you ask, you know, tell the cashier you want to pay for the car that's behind you. These are ways to give alms anonymously because then now you're not looking for any kind of recognition. They don't even know who was in the car. They're not paying really attention to the, to the car that's in front of them. And then to get to the window and find out that their meal has been paid is a great thing. Okay. Uh, did you have any examples of giving alms? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, girl, I had to switch to my phone and I don't even know how to mute it. So anyway, uh, forgive any sound in the background then. Um, yeah, but that, that same thing um, that I've done in the past uh, between, and like I said, I'm sorry, you got frozen for me. So many of the things that you said, I wasn't able to hear. Um, I had to go and come back in. So forgive me if I repeat something, but I did hear you talking about paying it forward. Um, I've done that in the past and it has been great because a lot of the times 
in a situation like that, it prompts other people, a lot of other people in the line to keep doing it, um, which, you know, that that's a special feeling in and of itself, uh, whether it's at uh, Chick-fil-A or Starbucks or something like that. And usually it not only blesses the people behind you and encourages them, but it also blesses the person who's taking the orders like, wow, you know, um, they, they do get excited about it, too, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, they do get excited. And um, not only doing that, but uh, though cer certain places in the city have those like blessing boxes um, that have where you can put canned goods or whatever in so that whoever is homeless um who, who happens upon it or maybe people who are in that neighborhood who can't afford or whatever, they could go to that box and take things out. And that's another good thing because sometimes, especially like myself or with my schedule or even just in general, how we find excuses because maybe we're, uh, you know, we don't know who we can trust or whatever the case may be. Um, and we can come up with all sorts of excuses, but something like that takes that element away where there's no excuse. You can give even, you know, you might not come in direct contact with the person who receives the item. But when you put it in that box, you can pray over it. You can add little gifts. You can attach scriptures to something that whoever um, comes to the box may be blessed through it. Um, and there might be people that you wouldn't come into contact on a regular basis. Like when I, most of our homeless are, let's say downtown Charleston, I'm never down there. Um, so it could be easy to say, oh, I never, you know, see anyone or, or whatever, but that gives an opportunity for it. And even, and I think I caught a glimpse of you mentioning this previously, but, you know, being at the store and having somebody behind you and just saying, Hey, I'm gonna, you know, you know, may I pay for that for you, um, or whatnot? Whenever the feeling strikes, and sometimes not the feeling, but whenever God lays it on your heart, sometimes He lays it on your heart when you don't hardly have. Um, and, and then it, you turn around and walk into another blessing for yourself. Yes, and then oftentimes, um, just like a previous scripture that we looked at mention um especially when it mentioned the family and this isn't necessarily limited to family but sometimes we don't give to people because we know they have more than us or we know what kind of job they have or we see what kind of car they're driving or whatever the case may be and so we might hold back but i've learned in the past that Whatever somebody has, that means nothing if the Lord prompts you to give to them because you never know why he's leading you to do that. You never know what their internal needs are. And sometimes it's just something where the Lord wants to see if you're even going to be obedient to do it in the first place. So not to hold back um, from doing that. Even people on the workplace, um, I remember recently there's a, a bag that I have um, that I really like. And there was somebody at work um, that I went to to get something um, to eat, which I rarely did uh, at our deli. And this young lady was so sweet, so nice. Um, and she gave me a, a pack of like espresso beans, chocolate covered espresso beans, because we had a quick conversation about how much we enjoy coffee and whatever. And that was out of her heart. That was something that she didn't have to do. Um, and just because she was so sweet, I felt led to bless her back. And she had commented on my bag. And so from her commenting on my bag, I said, you know, I, I'm going by home later, you know, so I actually brought a bag that I had just recently purchased tags on and everything that I hadn't worn yet. And I brought it to her and she was, you know, um, she had gone for the day. So I left, I had packaged it up really nice in a gift bag with a thank you card and whatnot and given it to her. And the bag that I have, there's a group on um, Facebook that has everybody who, you know, who are customers and we talk back and forth. And I just mentioned it that, hey, this person was so sweet and what they did, even though it may have seemed little that, you know, I gifted one of our favorite bags to this individual. 
and just, you know, over a hundred comments of people like, oh, that is, you know, so amazing. That makes me want to do something. The company actually reached out and said, man, that's so cool. We want to give you a bag to gift to somebody else. Wow. Um, and so, you know, that, that prompted other people to think about um, things. Some people comment and they're like, oh, that's so nice of you. I'm like, no, that was so nice of her to count it not robbery to have that exchange and to be kind and then to go in her own stash and say, here's something that I like. Maybe you'll enjoy it. And so it's just because she was kind, then that prompted more kindness in return. And that was the comments, you know, whenever people commented, I just reminded them, hey, I only did this because she was kind. So let that be a reminder to us that we never know what our acts of kindness uh, to other people, what that's going to prompt. It does create a chain. And you know, when you read the Testament of Job, the Testament of Job, I'm not talking about the book of Job and the canon, but the extra reading, the Testament of Job, it tells us that as a king, he was so given to philanthropy and gave so much to all of the countryside, the, the, the uh, people who dwelled within his country and abroad, till everyone in the country tried to outgive each other because they love the fact that how he gave, you know? It's something about giving that does spur others into giving. You can give something to a homeless person and if you give them an abundance of something and go around the corner, you'll see them sharing with other homeless people. There's just something about giving that creates a chain of effect. And I could tell you, there is no greater feeling than when you give someone without wanting anything in return. It's just a wonderful feeling. You can go and get gift cards, put them in envelopes or buy little cards of encouragement to put the gift cards in. And as the spirit leads you, just hand it to somebody. I saw where a lady gets gifts, uh, she puts $20 bills. She goes to different stores in the infant section and she'll slide $20 bills into the boxes of diapers through the little flaps on the box. No one that receives it will ever have a clue that it's her. But as a parent with an infant, money is always something that is uh, on the cusp of being short. And so to open your Pampers gift box and see a random $20 bill is always going to be desirable and bring some joy. You know, um, you, there are times when you could go to a checkout counter and those people who are working in service tend not all the time are they struggling people, but a lot of times they are young and struggling financially. And how nice would it be to buy them something for them to snack on during their break? You know, here, I want you to try this, this beverage on your break, or here's a, you know, candy bar, eat this on your break, whatever, while you're paying for your thing. There is no shortage of ways that we can give alms to others. And it's always a beautiful thing. Uh, the last question that we, well, the question that we skipped was, do you find it difficult to fast? Um, well, I think in the past, especially um, when we did lots of corporate fasts and stuff like that, um, ain't, there ain't nothing like the hunger that hits you um, when you have decided that you're going on a fast. Now, especially for me, because, and I'm like, I know it ain't nothing but the devil, because plenty of days, I'll sit there, my friend will get on me like, oh, you didn't eat today? Shocking. Uh, because it just, I don't have to. It Occupied and not on your mind. Yeah, but the minute it's like, oh, I think I'm going to fast today. Wake up hungry. Start off hungry. No, no, I don't eat breakfast normally, but let me consciously decide I'm going to fast, um, which I need to do more of. 
Um, but it's just like suddenly just thoughts of sugar plums dancing in your head when you never <laughs> even wanted sugar plums. Now here it is. Uh, and, and auntie said French fries. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things um, like that, but on a different note, as far as finding it difficult to fast and why I said I need to do better with it is I, I found um, just like we were talking about earlier about intermittent fasting and the um, popularity of fasting in the world. And um, I feel like maybe a few years ago, I'm like, just fasting is everywhere. People are just fasting for no reason other than, Oh, I heard it's good for your health. Oh, this, that. And the the spiritual aspect has been taken away from it a lot as far as worldwide. And to me, I felt like, boy, isn't the devil something that he loves to come in and take something that is holy and that God has instituted and turn it into something common that people just, oh, yes, I'm intimate and, and fascinated. And self-centered, self-centered. Yes. He took, yes. he took the fo he took with all that fasting and intermittent fasting, he took the focus off of the most high and put it, everybody became self-absorbed about it. Yes, yes. And so I feel like where I where I notice when I look at back at it um now and why I say I need to correct myself and consciously um make it a point to fast more is because I kind of got wrapped in my own mind of being hyper conscious of I don't want to just be fasting for no reason just to fast you know um you know I want the I want to feel like the Lord told me to fast or whatever but that's that's not <laughs> that's that ain't the thought process that necessarily needs to be there so that was taking information that I was seeing logging it into my brain and then going on a path that was not necessary um, to restrict myself from doing what I should do just because the world has taken it to the left-hand side. So I need to correct myself on, on that uh, thinking that I had. Now, I have heard several people or many people say that, you know, they don't fast just to fast. They have to have a reason to fast or they feel like the Lord has to lead them to fasting from the beginning. We were commanded to fast and we don't have to have a reason for fasting. The most high, once you start your fast, will give you what you're just like in Romans. We read where the spirit groans and make utterances for us where we know not what to pray. When you start a fast just out of the obedience that it's something that we should be doing on a regular basis, the most high will let his spirit tell you what you are fasting for. If that someone might drop into your spirit that you need to be fasting for that you haven't even spoken to. You don't even know their situation. They may seem like everything's going well with them, but they come into your mind and it might be for you to fast for that person or that for, or for a situation. But if nothing else, fasting, when we do it the right way, keeps us in a powerful position because we know we are engaged with spiritual warfare on a daily basis. So it keeps our spirit up. It strengthens our spirit, man, and makes the enemy have to fight a little bit more to afflict us or come against us. So yes, we don't necessarily have to have a direct word from the most high as to why we're fasting. We can fast just because we're supposed to fast as believers. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing. Um, I feel like in the church, um, a lot, first of all, the, that teaching is not prevalent. They talk about fasting, but they don't go into um, or did not go into the scriptures of like actually his, him commanding us to fast and that it's okay too fast so it's e it was easy to um take on that mindset of like oh i gotta make sure you know that it's right and then also for me being somebody who you know for years has worked on losing weight in the past something that i would focus on too is oh my gosh I can't, I can't fast right now because just the other day I was trying to diet or whatever. And like, my mind is just 
focus on dieting. So my spirit is shifted, uh, trying to say that I'm going to fast, but am I really fasting or is it just like diet? Am I going to be hyper-focused on, did I lose any weight during the fast or something like that? Which for me personally, as I discovered, uh, I needed to eat more in the first place. So if I do fat, when I do fast now, it's, it has nothing to do with weight loss because I do not lose weight when I don't eat. <laughs> so, well, you know, with the opposite. Um, a, a, a lot of what a lot of people don't realize is that um, struggles with weight is a spiritual struggle. There are spirits uh, that are attached to being overweight and so forth. And so fasting can help you to overcome those strongholds, not necessarily to lose weight, but to gain dominion over the spirit that's afflicting you or oppressing you. Mm -hmm. And so you can starve those spirits out through fasting and prayer. It's important that when we fast, that we incorporate, incorporate worship and prayer into it, along with reading of the word. We don't want to just abstain from food, but we want to bring on more of the most high. And we know that wherever he has spilled, whatever he has spilled up, darkness can't be there. And so it drives away any spirit that's trying to oppress you or possess you. And mm -hmm. that's very important as well. Um, while we're talking about fasting, I would like to end on clarifying the Daniel fast. A lot of people read in scripture, not the fast that he did for 21 days, but they will pull out the scripture where him and his three friends uh, told the eunuch that they didn't want to eat the king's food. And they they did not eat the choice meat from the king's palace and they abstained from some of the drinks and the other foods that, that was given to those who were taken captive. And people who do not know much about the laws that the Israelites followed um, or don't know much about fasting, they say that him and his friends were fasting, but in fact, they were not. They were finding a way to be obedient to the dietary laws that they upheld. We see that Daniel was a man, even at, in his youth, that always had a heart for the Most High and observed those ordinances that they were given uh, at all times or as much as possible. You know, he was human, so I'm sure he faltered here or there, but he's credited with being one who was very obedient. So that was not a Daniel fast that they were doing they were adhering to the dietary laws that was given to the Israelites, uh, which is beneficial for the whole world, but we're not talking about eating today. We're talking in the, in the sense of dietary laws. That's a whole nother lesson. Uh, I enjoyed the lesson today. I don't know if you did, but um, I, did. I was edified as I was pulling the scriptures and, and reading and refreshing myself. So. Yeah. Um, if you don't, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Sort of. So um, you mentioned, uh, and as we've seen, that if we begin fasting, like God will give us a, uh, he will reveal, reveal a reason for us um, in that in that fast. And I have to say that at least a couple of times recently, I uh, what I have now dubbed to my own self as an accidental fast. <laughs> we're, not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna make that a real thing, but it was a day where I just went without food um, and not an intention of fasting, but it just happened that way. Um, and in that same time, uh, when I reflected back either the next day or something or later that same day and I said, you know, I saw where something broke or someone, something happened um, that 
it had an effect, even though I did not intentionally set out to say, today I'm going to fast for this reason or whatever. Um, and the Lord still used that or whether he put it in me to abstain and then something happened. Uh, so yeah. shout out to God and the spirit who be leading you to do stuff and you didn't even know you were being led to do something. Amen. <laughs> right, exactly. And you know, um, sometimes it, it, we can abstain from fasting and like you just gave an example of and something that you didn't even know was a petition that really will become manifested, you know? Uh, fasting, it, going into a fast without something in particular also is beneficial because it keeps our discernment heightened as we go, th as we walk through from day to day. So we might not feel like we're fasting for a particular thing, but when we are met with something that we can't see beyond the veil, we're then able to see behind the veil. We could see what is the plan of the enemy. Things became, become clear to us when we keep ourselves in a state of fasting or in the practice of fasting. It's funny how you said when you fasting, you immediately become hungry because I have actually fasted, said, told myself, okay, I'm just gonna fast for five hours or I'm just gonna fast for three hours. Maybe even, I don't think I've ever just done a one hour fast, but there's nothing wrong with that. Um, because just as soon as you say you're going to fast for the next hour and pray for this situation, soon as you say that, you're right. That's when you will be your hungriest. <laughs> and we all know <laughs> we've gone hours without eating, but let you just set your intention on fasting and praying for one hour. And uh, there's something powerful about that. You know, even Christ asked the disciples, could you not pray for one hour? <laughs> you know, as soon as you set your mind to it, that enemy is going to attack and try to distract you. So it's all beneficial whenever you set the, whatever perimeters you set for your fast, it's all to the glory of the most high. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. Well, with that, it's been delightful. And I'll say... Shabbat shalom. Have a beautiful day. You too. Bye.